everybody. Uh, Dr. Hackney here again. I hope you're having a great day. Uh, and this is the next topic that we're going to talk about. Uh, we call this neuromechanical principles because the interesting thing is that the limbs and the body generate torques and forces. And those are a combination of the mechanical properties of the muscles, tissues, and joints, uh, as well as the neural input to the muscles. And it's actually really hard to parse out how much of each of those mechanical outputs, the forces or the torques, are the result of either of those factors. The first of these principles that we're going to talk about today are interaction torques. Interaction torques are basically the effect of movement on one part of the body on a different part of the body. For example, interaction torques is how one can develop really high force or speed at an end effector, in this case a tennis racket, which is in the hand of Venus Williams, who is about to deliver an overhead smash. So in this case, the torque starts with her whole body rotating to the right uh, over her feet, which are not even on the ground in this case. And the rotation is not at a really high angular velocity, but it's her whole body. So the torque contribution is pretty great. Now, added on top of that is the rotation of the shoulder, in this case into extension, a deduction, and internal rota rotation. Added on top of that is the extension of the elbow, and added on top of that is the flexion of the wrist. Uh, and all of these torques summated together uh, allow for a really considerable amount of torque at the end. It's like cranking a whip. Our limbs, such as our legs, when we're walking or running or hopping, behave like springs. So our whole limb behaves as a linear spring. And the drawing over on your right is an example of a linear spring. So, for instance, if we're running, that spring of our leg compresses, and then as we push off from the ground, it recoils. Within the limbs, the joints behave like torsional springs. So, speaking of, for example, in the leg in running, the hip, knee, ankle, and midfoot all bend and then recoil. The greater the deformation, that is, the greater the spring is compressed or the greater the torsional spring is bent, the greater the resistance. In other words, the stiffness, K, increases with the change in length. Or change. In fact, that stiffness can be expressed in a really simple equation of stiffness equals force over change in length of a limb, or stiffness equals torque over change of an angle. And the physiological resistance um, to the unconstrained rotation of joints is a function of the length of the internal and external moment arms, which are factors that we've thought a little bit about already in this semester. Uh, the mechanical properties of specific muscles, factors that we'll think about uh, pretty thoroughly in the unit to come uh, this semester, uh, actively generated muscular tension, and a factor that we're not going to think too much about in this semester, but is really interesting when you think about sports or exercise or their high velocity activities, which is the elastic energy return of connective tissues. A spring stores and returns energy or recoils. Uh, another thing that can happen, though, is damping. Damping is absorbing energy, and surfaces can be damping like a gymnastics mat, which is one of the reasons that it's so hard to stick the landing. Uh, but also, the limbs can behave as energy dampers, uh, as you see in this video here. The woman is jumping, but instead of using her legs like a spring, she just absorbs all the energy with her legs. And so her legs and lower body is behaving as an energy damper. I will show you. And one more time. Energy all absorbed by the lower body. Now, our limbs behave as energy dampers in another way. 
Most commonly with the arm as we're reaching towards something with our hand, but this characteristic of damping is actually characteristic of the kind of movement. So if we were reaching for something with our foot or with our nose, we would see the same effect. So what happens, for instance, if we are reaching upward is first we get a muscle activation from the triceps, which initiates the movement. However, then in order to slow down that movement or damp the movement, we get a muscle activation or a damping muscle activation of the biceps that's slowing down the movement. Now, if the biceps just works all by itself, it will slow down the movement too much. So we have a third uh, muscle activation of the triceps, which is called the counter damping movement. So we're able to get our hand exactly to where we want to in space. The expression coordination is probably one that you've used before, and most frequently it means it uh, refers to people who are very good at picking up new psychomotor skills easily. So, for instance, if the first time somebody tries ice skating, they're already good at it, we would usually say that that person is very coordinated. But that's actually not what that expression means in the term of neuromuscular control. Uh, what it means is the relationship between two or more body parts uh, in order to achieve a particular goal. So for instance, uh, in the example on the slide, we see a gymnast who is balancing on a very small area of her toes and metatarsal heads, as we see here. Uh, and with that very small base of support, uh, she's got uh, the ball in her arm ahead, but she has her leg back generating a equivalent amount of torque so she can remain balanced on that very small base of support. That's an example of what we would call coordination. There are three kinds of factors in the terms of neuromotor control. First are the invariants, and invariants are so-called because they are not free to vary at all. So for example, if I drop a bowling ball, here on Earth, it will fall to the floor. It will never fall to the ceiling. Something that we're going to talk about in the next unit also is the Henneman size principle. We'll get into that more. But what that describes is how the motor units associated with the smallest alpha motor neurons will recruit first. Always happens that way. Always, always, always. The next thing are restraints, and restraints are factors which do not vary by design, and usually there's consequences when they do vary. For example, the ACL restrains the tibia from gliding more than 5 millimeters anteriorly on the femur. When the tibia does glide more than 5 millimeters anterior on the femur, then usually there's pretty severe consequences in terms of ACL insufficiency or the ACL breaking. And constraints are behaviors which are naturally facilitated, but not obligatory. If I were in class with you, I would demonstrate this by jumping off a chair. So the chair is about 20 inches high. And when you jump off something like that, usually your knees, hips, and ankles bend quite a bit in order to absorb the force. Now, if you want to, you can jump off a chair and keep your legs stiff. And it's really uncomfortable because of the shock but you can do it if you want to. So the limbs compressing through the joints bending is an example of a neuromotor constraint. And most neuromotor control mechanisms or neural control mechanisms are constraints. Degrees of freedom is an expression that you've probably heard and perhaps you've heard it in terms of statistics. In this context, what it means are those factors which are free to vary so long as the invariance, restraints, and constraints of neuromotor control are preserved. So for example, here's a picture of a woman doing a squat with her feet planted securely on the floor. So extending the leg with the foot planted on the floor or the ground can be done through several different muscle groups and usually is done through a combination, but it can be done through the knee extending the quadriceps, which is what most of you are familiar with, but also it can be done through the plantar flexors. You'll see this sometimes when you're trying to get
quadriceps activity some, from somebody with knee pain. They use their plantar flexors in this, what we call the closed kinetic chain, that is that the foot is on the ground, for example, and the body moving on top of it. Uh, that way the plantar flexors can actually extend the knee. Or the knee can be extended through extension of the hip. Uh, people who have had uh, amputation uh, above the knee uh, and are using a prosthesis with a mechanical knee extend their knees this way. The fellow in the picture here is my major professor from the University of Minnesota when I was working on my doctoral studies. He is a German named Jürgen Konstadt. And one time in class, he sighed extravagantly because we students had not heard of Nikolai Bernstein. Nikolai Bernstein, and here's a photo of him here, he was a Russian physiologist, and his work was done in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, and he concluded many things about neuromotor control before we had the ability to test them empirically. Now that our ability to in test principles of neuromotor control empirically have improved, it turns out that a lot of Bernstein's hypotheses were correct. So Bernstein was rather like the Einstein of neuromotor control. One of the principles that Bernstein proposed was that almost any movement has too many factors to try to control centrally from the brain itself. Uh, those factors include passive and interaction torques, and also include the fact that the generation of muscular tension is a rather slow phenomenon. So for example, uh, if the quadriceps waited until the foot contacted the ground in order to generate enough tension to hold the knee stable, then we would fall to the ground with each step. Therefore, the degrees of freedom uh, that we experience need to be constrained in order to move efficiently. An example of a biomechanical variable that is a strong constraint is that what the central nervous system really knows is reaching trying to get our end effector, which is our hand in the case of the upper extremity, to our target. When we meet next Wednesday, please remind me to show this to you. Uh, but um, so long as we are getting our hand to the target, uh, like this actor in the GIF, and hopefully this is an actor, otherwise her GIF for physical comedy is totally going to waste, uh, the joint angle combination to get the hand to the target, the rope in this case, can vary. The individual internal joint moments were being generated by the muscles can vary. Uh, and the muscular recruitment needed to generate that moment also can vary. So those are all degrees of freedom that can vary as long as this actor gets her hand to the rope. Reflexes are a way that the central nervous system reduces the degrees of freedom. So if we are to step on a tack or put our hand on a burner that hasn't cooled off, then we don't need to think about it in order to withdraw our foot or our hand. It happens through reflexes, so there is less load on the brain. Uh, an example of this is the flexor withdrawal. We were actually just talking about that. So if some villainous rascal has hidden a tack, on the dance floor and the dancer steps on it, then there's noxious stimulus that goes up to the spinal cord. And that signal goes to an interneuron, uh, which stimulates the leg flexors on the same side as the noxious stimulus, including the hip flexors, the hamstrings or the knee flexors as well to get that foot away from the noxious stimulus, the tack in this case. Now, in the case of the lower body, uh, if one leg lifts up uh, and there's no reaction from the other leg, then the person would fall down and the central nervous system just hates for us to fall down. This is what the kinesthetic learning activity that we're going to do uh, for this week has to do about. So we have the crossed extension. Uh, and so the signals from the 
sensory neurons about stepping on the tack also cross the spinal cord uh, to interneurons, which will activate the gluteals, the quadriceps, and the plantar flexors on the opposite ankle so that the dancer can withdraw her left foot, which just stepped on the tack, without also reflexes like the flexor withdrawal and crossed extension are short loop reflexes because they have few synapses and frequently don't even progress to the brain itself but are completed within the spinal cord. Long loop reflexes also reduce the degrees of freedom. Uh, and long loop reflexes are those which do include the brain and go through several uh, synapses. Simple learned motor responses include long loop reflexes. So for example, right now you can just make the motions with your fingers of tying your shoes. You've done that thousands and thousands of times. So the finger motion of tying your shoes is an example of a long loop reflex. Long loop reflexes can be developed through motor learning. There are two phenomena, motor learning and motor accommodation. They're a little different from each other, so we're going to explain each of them really briefly. Motor learning is when a sequence of signals to the motor system is somehow permanently stored in the central nervous system. Uh, there's a lot of research that is documenting the behavior of motor learning and has been for a long time, but exactly where in the central nervous system it's stored uh, is not well understood. Probably the mechanism through which it's stored is distributed through the brain. Motor accommodation is more thoroughly understood, and you'll talk a lot about it uh, in neuroanatomy and neuroscience, but it's mainly accomplished by feedback loops between the brainstem and the cerebellum, and then output from the cerebellum to motor systems. So for example, when you first learn to use a hammer, uh, then you're undergoing motor learning. You need many thousands of repetitions in order to be able to do it well. But when you go from a 12 ounce hammer to a 20 ounce hammer, the amount of muscular torque that you need to generate is a little bit different. So it just takes um, probably a few dozen repetitions in order to accommodate to that new hammer. You've probably mostly experienced another example. So if you work out on a treadmill, uh, then probably you will warm up by walking for a couple minutes. Then you might run for a while, maybe 10, 12 minutes, and then cool down by walking a little bit. Now, when you get off the treadmill, for the first dozen steps, it feels like your feet have a mind of their own. But what you're really experiencing uh, is motor accommodation because the motor demands of walking across the floor are a little different than the motor demands of walking on a treadmill. And you're just experiencing the effect of your central nervous system through motor accommodation adjusting the motor, the feet forward motor demands back to what they need to be in order to effectively walk across the floor. The sensation that we need to make these adjustments uh, and carry forth a lot of these other reflexes uh, is called proprioception. You've heard that expression before, but it has several definitions. The definition that I'm going to use for my classes over the next couple of semesters is very broad. So it includes sensation of muscle tension, joint position, angular acceleration, and pressure and vibration. It travels on large diameter, fast conducting nerve fibers. The reason for that is that if we are about to fall over, the central nervous system has to get that information to the muscles quickly. Otherwise, we're going to fall over it. On the other hand, if we have a toothache, which is the kind of neural information that travels on slow conducting C fibers, we can live for a minute without knowing about that. Here are the principles that we've thought about during this particular lecture over the past 20 minutes. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good day.